When I came up with the idea for the cold moon, I was looking around for, I guess what I would call, icons of terror. You know, my job is really to terrify my audience. I get a great thrill out of doing that. And uh, I don't want them to have a good night's sleep. I want them to stay up late at night, miss work, because they're, they're so nervous about finishing my book. And I was thinking, I've done the typical serial killer, and I've had the very nefarious hitman sort of character, and they've all been more or less creepy kind of characters. But I was thinking something from my past that utterly terrified me when I was a child was a clock that my grandparents had. It was an old-time clock. I think they actually called it a grandmother clock, a uh, grandfather clock being, of course, the clock that sits on the floor, a grandmother clock sat on the mantelpiece, a tabletop clock. But it had a very eerie face on it, kind of a, a full moon face that was sort of smiling and wasn't really smiling. And I don't know, for some reason, the, the memory of that came back to me when I was looking around for a new Lincoln Rhyme book to write. And I thought, ah, that's my idea right there. Because time is, you know, pretty much unstoppable. It's pretty much final. When you look at it, all the hours are counting down to that one moment of our mortality. And I thought, oh, well, I'm going to create a character. I wasn't quite sure what I'd call him, but ultimately I settled on the name the watchmaker, who incorporates clocks and watches into his plans of, of murder. And the book took off from there. I really had no interest in clocks and time before I started the book. One of the best things about being a writer is that we authors get to satisfy our curiosities. It's so, so much fun to pick a topic that we know very little about and then go out and research it. For instance, in my book, The Vanished Man, another Lincoln Rhyme book, I knew nothing about magic and illusion, but that became the focus of that novel. In my book, uh, The Stone Monkey, that was centered around illegal immigration and Asian culture, about which I knew very little before I started the book. For a short period of time afterwards, I was a bit of an expert. When it comes to my latest book, The Cold Moon, I really didn't have much of a knowledge of timepieces and horology and uh, the history of time. Over the course of the eight months, which I spend researching and outlining my books, I read a great deal of material. I became very uh, fascinated with the subject, so much so that I uh, kept my eye on uh, collector's piece watches. It plays an important role in the book. There's a particular pocket watch that's a significant clue that Lincoln Rhyme seizes upon, and I want to buy one of those now. I've got my eye out on the market. I check eBay rather regularly for them. There are a number of themes in The Cold Moon, as in all of my books. One of my hallmarks, readers may be familiar with, is the concept of a twisty ending. I love to surprise my readers. But I've also learned over the course of doing this for about 25 or 30 years that readers are incredibly bright and incredibly perceptive usually more perceptive and brighter than I am. Although I do incorporate twists into the book, it's not enough just to have a single big twist. Therefore, I incorporate a number of subplots into my stories, and each one of those has a twist of its own. I'm kind of betting, I hope at least, that if a reader gets one twist or even two, there'll be that third zinger that catches up with them. Now, there's something else I like to do these are crime books. All of the Lincoln Rhyme books and my standalone books as well are all about crime, killer of some sort, sometimes not serial killers, but certainly there's death and destruction in the books. And that is one form of suspense, and we really need it in a crime book. You know, ideally, most readers have not had too much experience. We certainly hope no firsthand experience with that kind of drama and conflict. But we've all had experience with personal relationship issues, matters of conflict between our spouses, our partners, our parents, our children, co-workers, and so forth. And so in every one of my books, in addition to featuring, having as the core plot, you might say, a crime that needs to be solved, a killer who needs to be stopped, I include personal relationship issues. I call that with some affection the soap opera stuff. And each one of those issues I think has an immediacy for my readers and also has a big twist at the end. So in The Cold Moon, for instance, we have a plot in which Amelia learns some very troubling things about her own family history. 
That is a plot that continues along with the Lincoln Rhymes endeavor to catch the watchmaker. And at the end, it is resolved. I won't say for good or for bad, but it is definitely resolved, just as we have in The Cold Moon, a terrorism plot. Although my books are not current events books, I don't write them to get up on a soapbox. I think it was Ernest Hemingway who said, if you want to send a message, go to Western Union. Don't put that material in your book. I firmly believe that. But it's very hard to write about crime and to write about New York City nowadays without acknowledging that the world is different. After September 11th, things changed. And uh, this book certainly is not about September 11th by any means, but it certainly is a shadow that persists. When I create my characters, whether they're the victims, potential victims, or the good guys, or the villain, I try to give them a um, sense of reality. I write my books to be emotionally engaging experiences. I don't want somebody to finish a Deaver book and say, oh my, that was interesting. I want them to say, oh, whew, I survived. In order to achieve the highest level of emotional connection I can, we need to care about every single person in that book. I think about the really bad made-for-TV films, and I can say this because this is my hairline. You have a villain who's a bald guy wearing a black leather jacket, and sometimes he has a ponytail. You don't even need to develop that villain. At most, you make him head of an oil company or a drug company, and then by definition, he's the bad guy. Well, we don't really care about that character, by the same token, if you have, say, a film like the Halloween movies or a Friday the 13th films, you have an attractive young co-ed who probably smokes a cigarette, and that's the reason for her to die, of course. We know nothing about her. We have no investment in her. In my books, I do spend time setting up my characters. The um, potential victims in the story are quite real. They have their own conflict. I don't just give background material. I like to create a sense of tension even within their own lives that has nothing to do with whether or not they're going to survive. For instance, in the cold moon, there's a woman soldier who is back from Iraq on leave. She's in New York to receive an award for some of her military endeavors. Yes, she is a potential victim. The killer is clearly stalking her, and I'm obviously not going to say what happens at the end, but even before we find out that the killer, the watchmaker, has targeted her, we're let in on the fact that she has a real conflict that has nothing to do with the potential crime. It's a conflict she has within her own life, and that's where we meet her. And suddenly we are now rooting for her not only to survive the watchmaker, but to try to come to some resolution for this conflict that has been troubling her all along. And, uh, of course, as I said earlier, all of these are resolved. There's a twist at the end of this as well. But that's just typical of my approach to characters. We have to believe in them. We have to feel for them. And that's what keeps us up 